The readings and activities this week draw together the ideas, concepts, and research methods learned thus far in the sociology of religion. While sociologists cannot, through social science methods, confirm or repudiate the existence of God, they can confirm that people believe or do not believe in God, they can describe and explain religious practices, and they can connect these empirically with other beliefs, opinions, and behaviors. As such, whether the sociologist is a believer, atheist, or agnostic, makes no difference in how they formulate research questions or create studies to address these questions. We begin this week with a brief introduction from the late Andrew Greeley, who was a Roman Catholic priest in the Diocese of Chicago, perhaps best known to the American public through his many novels, but to sociologists through his affiliation with NORC and his empirical quantitative approach to the study of religion. Just like other vowed religious, Greeley took as his starting point the origins and raw power of religion, which is evident to any independent observer. Thus, the brief opening paragraph in chapter 4 pro provides an appropriate introduction to the metal or substance in the sociology of religion. There is, claims Greeley, a cognitive component, but more important is the infrastructure, the non-rational religious experience, its symbols, stories, communities, rituals, worldview, and ethos. Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman move even further in the direction of bracketing the non-rational religious experience, taking as their starting point for the sociology of religion a premise that all conceptions of reality are created by humans in a three-step dialect dialectical process. Durkheim's definition of the sacred and profane draw us back into the lived experience of religion through the power of the sacred, those non-empirical forces behind symbols and entities that are set apart. Likewise, examples of the holy from Rud Rudolf Otto point to the reported experiences of individuals and their encounters with the holy other, the awe and mystery of, and attraction to, these unapproachable, dangerous forces. In my judgment, a discussion of magic as a plausibly distinct set of practice, practices is best framed within this material on the broader meaning system comprised of elements characteristic of religion. Both religion and magic are serious attempts to deal with and solve the basic problems people face. Both are based on faith in the existence and efficacy of power that cannot be seen and can only be inferred by results. Both involve ritual activity, and both are bona fide elements of the group's larger culture. Religion, in contrast to magic, more often centers on overarching issues as such as salvation and the meaning of life and death. Magic, at least according to some anthropologists and sociologists, is more likely to be grappling with current concrete problems. Religion is more future-oriented. Magic is primarily concerned with the here and now. Religion's orientation is one of obeisance and supplication. Magic is more manipulative. The chart on slide six are summarized, summarize the differences between magic and religion, 
The chart is not unlike that found in Robertson Yamini on page 11. Professor Christian Smith, in his uh, award-winning book, notes, I see no reason to divorce religion and magic conceptually. Likewise, the late Martin Riesebrot, in The Promise of Salvation, notes that an advantage of his definition of religion is that the extremely problematic distinction between magic and religion falls away. Ruth brought further notes that fixation on this distinction leads to modes of investigation that are more theological than sociological. Thus, it's worthwhile to review once again the definitions of religion from Professor Smith and from Professor Riesebrot in the context of our work for this week. Their mutual focus on practice, that is, the mutual focus of Riesbrot and Smith on liturgical practice or the practices of religion, make the sociological understanding easier to swallow in ways manifest in the diagram by Roberts and Yamini on page 98. We can only observe the rituals and symbols that surround that core experience or core encounter, and then ask what they mean to their creators. The non-rational or mystical experience at the center falls largely within the domain of theology. Can and should sociologists properly examine the worldviews and ethical systems, including the texts, that develop around the center. One of the things I love the most about teaching at Queens is the range of aptitude and preparation among the students. While the appropriate audience for the Riesebrot lecture on, on the site in week five might be advanced graduate students and professionals, at least several of you, if you have the time, will enjoy it. You will need to listen to it slowly and perhaps several times.